Hello and welcome to Heiser Media's first disc golf podcast. We're calling it the Heiser Cast. I'm Dave Oster, joined here with Joanna Latini and Lou Garcia. Let's get into it. So we're going to get right into it. A little bit about what this podcast is going to be. We're going to talk about the local scene, maybe a little bit about the pros, but more so just talk about disc golf in general. We're going to talk about different topics things that are of interest in the sport, and uh, maybe some tips for new players and things like that. Um, I want to start a little bit about who we are, our involvement with Heiser Media, disc golf in general. Um, so I'll start a little bit about myself. I started Heiser Media at the beginning of 2020, um, started filming tournaments, different fun rounds, things like that. Got involved with a lot of cool people like this. Um, playing disc golf really was a fun new hobby during the pandemic as a lot of different people uh, were and I decided to combine my two passions of videography and disc golf into Heiser Media so that's what I'm doing. Excellent. How about you guys? Amazing well kind of what you said pandemic really brought um, disc golf into my life and yeah I'm a pandemic golfer started in uh, July 2020 and have really just jumped in all the way and should I say I'm obsessed? Is that a bad word to use? That's but where, that's I, where we all get. Everybody, everybody <laughs> okay, I'm obsessed. I love it. Yeah, it's uh, it's a real bright spot in my life. And uh, gosh, how did I get connected with you guys? Uh, we meet on playing? the course. Yeah, yeah. we meet on, on the, the course, course. Meet and course. realize that we have a great time together. First video was uh, the Ace Room video. That's right. And if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Yes, and yeah, happy to now be doing the podcast. Excellent. How about you, Lou? I don't know how I got dragged into it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think coming to the events that we run, uh, you know, I, I met you there. Yep. Uh, I think we messaged a little bit back and forth. And then next thing that I knew, you were introducing me uh, yourself to me at, at a tournament. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was at Allaire. And then yep. uh, I guess my, my brain's always going, so I was just like, it's cool. Let's see, let's see what he's all about, and maybe he'll come out and do some filming. And we just became friends, so that's all been pretty organic and natural so far, so. Yeah. Now we're here, doing that's this right. podcast. Awesome. It's yeah. like, oh, <laughs> one idea to another, and uh, <laughs> I, I think it's it's really exciting, and, uh, I, you know, watching it grow and seeing other people excited about it, wanting to be a part of what, what you do and what you offer. We're here, we're doing this, Disc Golf Podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get right into it. Our first topic today is what makes a good disc golf course slash hole design. Lou, I know you've had some experience with course design, so I'll start with you. Yeah, this is hands down unarguable. I'd have a little sign here, change my mind. Um, <laughs> and this this goes for everybody. This is inarguable. I don't, uh, if you're a child, if you're a woman, if you're a man, if you're a senior citizen, every disc golf course needs a bathroom. Yeah, I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean, right? I agree, definitely. Yeah. There's just, there's, having some of like the, like life's necessities, water and a bathroom. At a so you're going course. towards the, the amenities of the course. I, th I think it's just a bar none thing. Yeah. If you can have it, it would be the first thing. Sure, yes, let's put it in there right away. Yeah. Because you end up with porter potties and, and, and public use and... You know, we're all respectful when we realize we're at our event and people put in money and they're putting up, you know, signs and there's vendors and there's, of course, porter potties and the people that are using it are there and love to be there and want to be there. And they, they tend to be treated really well. But when you have a uh, porter potty just sitting on the corner of the parking lot at your local course, it's just terrifying what goes on in there. Yeah. So bathroom, that's what goes into making... A good course. Yeah, <laughs> definitely the first start. It's the staple. I really thought you were going to just jump into hole design and like yeah. a course breakdown and for shots stuff, and things where you went bathroom. Yeah. That's that's interesting that that's the first thing that comes to your mind and not what the course breakdown is like. The, you have to think about the like whole as a course. designer, right? You, you have to if, if like from the parking lot to the <laughs> course to the experience to everything. I think about my play in a hole. I don't picture just going out of just throwing frisbees. So I want to know what the whole course has to offer for mm -hmm. my stay so and i always go at it like the angle like this if i had an opportunity to create something from a beginning with no nose in the way and uh, unlimited resources i'd want to build a course and my first thought would be the amenities like a bathroom uh that's amazing <laughs> i mean there's so many times countless at this point for courses that 
where do I <laughs> use the bathroom? That's I mean, troubling. men, you know, have a little bit easier time having, yeah, yeah, having to, you know, using yeah, the bathroom course, on the course. But it's um, it's a real thing. It's a, it's a concern. And I remember one tournament day, too, like, we got in our player's email beforehand. They said, hey, there's no access to a bathroom. Make sure you go to a Target or a Walmart before or at lunch or in between. And I just remember feeling, I don't know, like... I don't want to say alienated, but really that I, I wasn't thought about in the planning of this event. And that made me really nervous for the day. Like, yes, I packed my lunch, I packed my snacks, I had everything I needed, but the what if moment, like, what if I have to go? What if something happens? What if, and then I just, I knew there wasn't access and that I, it was a feeling that I really, and you really have to, disliked. You have to play like that. Then. And you have to play like that. And it's in the back of your head that, Hey, if something terrible. happens, you don't, you're not close to a, a safe space it's a to challenge. use the restroom. It's a challenge. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's one of the unfortunate parts of people who run tournaments are kind of at the mercy of what the courses have to offer. Like, you could be running a tournament and you just said you want a bathroom there, but it either costs money or right. it's not a possibility. So it almost goes back to, like you were saying, the design of the course in the first place, not just when you're going to a tournament, setting up for a tournament. You can't do it if it's not there. Right. So. That's a good point. Also, like the land, or if you're running a tournament, let's say if, if it's in a public park or a county park or whatever, what rules do they have in place? Like, can you bring in certain things? For how long? Can you set up early? Does that have to leave us right when the event's done? Like, there's just a lot. Yeah, there's hurdles with it, so. Yeah. So other than the amenities of a course, let's let's pick. Let's pick. <laughs> oh, well, well, so hold on real quick. It wasn't, it wasn't thought about. You're shocked to hear it, but now hearing it, what yeah. are your thoughts? Like, is it hard to undo that? No, it's a, it's, it's a thought. I think it's really, it's, it's, it's some, and for the most situation, not a luxury, not an option. Right. Let's be realistic here. Yeah. But um, I don't go at things thinking from a limited perspective right away. I always right. go from unlimited and break it down from there. Well, that's, that's a good yeah. way to think of things, yeah. so. I, yeah, I really just am surprised that that was the first thing that you <laughs> brought up. But I had a whole mature about it very quick. <laughs> no, but it's great. It, it really is great. I, you know a bathroom with a little fold down tray, you put the baby, you change the yeah. diaper. You gotta get the whole nine yards. Absolutely. You gotta start those disc golfers young, yeah. right? <laughs> in diapers. Um what do you what do you think goes into like making a good course in terms of designing a good course? I think well, I think you really have to look at the land that you have. The space, what are the natural obstacles that are there? I mean, mm -hmm. is it very wooded? Okay, if you have a very wooded park, you're not going to cut down all the trees to make an open course, right? So, like, right. where where is it set up well? What's a good flow? What can we envision here? And I think the best courses have a mixture of really wooded shots, hyzer line, and hyzer line, or forehand lines, open right. holes. It's, yeah, I think when you go out on a course, or, okay, not you, I should say me, my <laughs> experience. When I go out on a course, I want to be tested in all parts of my game, and I think... When there's a course that says, uh, you know, there's just a bunch of Stockheiser shots or something, anybody can do that. But I, I personally want to be challenged everywhere when I play. And I think that's a sign of a good course. Good challenge. Well-rounded challenge sounds, yeah. sounds appropriate for sure. Good I, variety. I like variety. And, and working with the land versus going against the grain, like you said, instead of just clear-cutting, you know, why would you go through all that? You just got to kind of yeah. work with what you got. See the landscape. I think that's good. Another thing that you said I also agree with and it's got to be really up there and, and good design is course flow. Mm. Oh, yeah. Walking dead walks and backtracks and stuff like that, it's, uh, it gets tiring. When you have a course where you could play something like, I don't know, 6,200 feet mm -hmm. in uh, two hours, that's a good flowing course. Yeah. And, and, and there's got to be challenge there, whether it's open or wooded. Mm -hmm. uh, a two hour round with so, you know, somewhere just over 6,000 foot of play, uh, flow is important. That can't be overlooked. That has to be really put into the design uh, with the layout. It becomes really important at that point. Yeah, and all these extra walking between holes just tires you out, especially like two round tournaments, stuff like that. Maybe a 6,200 foot course, but like you said, if it's not well designed with the flow of it, you could be walking 10,000 feet. And then twice in a day, it's going to affect your play by the end of the second round. Literally getting tired just because of the design of the flow of the course. Sure. But do you compromise the flow of the course because you really want to get over there and get that shot? Sometimes you got to bend, I think. Yeah, I'm sure there's a balance with everything. Yeah. But, you know, ideally, like you said. For, for the most part, where everybody's at with 
you know, like you could be incomer, like a, a brand new newcomer to the to the sport, feel adventurous and propose to your town. And next thing you know, they're leaning up against you, and you've been playing for a year and a half. You're gonna end up with a basket and tee pads on the ground, um, but you know who knows what you're gonna get. Right. Um, there's a lot of talented people out there designing courses, and there's a lot um, of camaraderie in our community uh, in our community so there's so much work that goes into building a course it's really like the families that build yeah. good courses so mm -hmm. yeah that's a, that's a good question so i'm really curious as to what people will comment in to see like what is their biggest concerns or what they think is like good design yeah i mean i think you also need to think of when you're laying it out crossing fairways what that looks like where are tee pads where are baskets where do errant shots go mm. where, like things like that danger um, factor yeah for yep. sure like is your head constantly on a swivel or are you able to focus in on where you're playing and not really be concerned about an errant disc getting you know Right, that's the last thing you want when you're just having a fun casual round mm -hmm. disc flies past your head yeah that's not, not what, what you want that's not what you want don't hit my dog <laughs> <laughs> or you Harris, how about that no me second no, oh okay the, okay the dog first dog's number one yeah i like that don't hit the dog priorities <laughs> point of the the whole conversation is don't hit dogs no. with this here we go no. <laughs> all right so let's move into another topic um so 2022 pdga rule changes recently came out want to discuss some of the more interesting ones um one of the first ones is that discs supported in the by the basket in any way now count as in. So what that differs um, a little bit how it used to be is now anywhere within the chains and the cage, inside, outside, if it's hanging off of it, if it's wedged in between some of the, the uh, parts of the metal, it all counts as in. And part of what that um, eliminates is the uh, ne necessity to see the disc fly into the basket, sometimes it's a blind shot, right. you just walk up and it's hanging off the basket or it's stuck on the side, you don't know if it went in and out and stuff like that. Right, because the old rule, or the most recent rule before the change was the disc had to have entry into the assembly of the basket over the tray and below the top band. And if it entered in any of that space, doesn't even have to touch a chain link technically, and then finds itself supported somehow by the outside of the basket, even if it's somehow wedged in, it's good. Right. But yeah, there's there's no way to really know for sure in some instances. So it's just it's just one of those rules. It's the target is what it is. You want to make it in. You want it to stop and come to rest at your target. Right. Mm -hmm. It's doing that. I don't care if it wedged in from the side. This going back to this is going back to how it used to be. Mm -hmm. People used to run all the time because the rules were actually a little different then, and I don't remember them verbatim, but it was that if the disc wedged into the side, it was good. But you would have people running after them because if it fell out, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. it didn't count. You walk up so it was like, on the ground. <coughs> how much yeah. time does right. it take for it to how be considered a lie? Right. Yeah. And I think that maybe that was a loose thing in the rules there, and that could have even been with the two meter rule. Mm -hmm. Not sure about that one, but it would make sense to me why they would run up to their lie yeah. to mm -hmm. try to retrieve that disc before it. I guess with this rule change, why don't we go all the way and say if a disc is on top? Yeah, that's the one thing you can't really practice as a skill. It's one of the most different parts of the basket. I'm not saying yeah. put that shot in your, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're, in your range and no. try to land on top. No. But, I mean, if we're going to you know, hit the cage and stick, what's different than, I don't know, being on the top and having it stay? <coughs> if it's being it supported be, by the basket. you got to make boundaries somewhere, and I think it's the bottom of the, the cage to the top of the chains, right? So as long as it's supported by the basket, I think part of the definition is where they're considering the basket. Like the sign on top of the basket with the number, that's not the, the basket. basket. Yeah. The, the support for the chains, and I think this is where the line draws isn't the basket that's the support of the basket yeah i just think it's an interesting pole in the middle is the support right sure of course if it's underneath resting on the ground leaning against the pole obviously that's not in right but if it's not on the ground yeah i'm, Ooh, I'm with you it's, it's, it's the, interesting like if we're going to discuss what is the basket and i i totally hear what you're saying i wonder where their discussions in the pdga where that lies I think what their thoughts are. The biggest thing with rule changes, or even why there's a rule change at all, 
is there, it's just unfavorable for the player in maybe a common sense application or that it's just um, too much gray area. Yeah. So if, sure. if it's going to be so, uh, something of a topic that's going to have gray area, you might as well just leave it be what it is. And I think that's what they're trying to do here uh, versus the headache of it's, it's dumb or all these questions or pressures on the TV. And it's got to be such an uncommon instance. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's just every once a I tournament, mean, if that listen, is this. I practice putting once at least a week since I've been playing disc golf. So I've never had an instance <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah where I've put it into the basket and something crazy flipped out. It landed on top. It was hanging off the rim by a knuckle. One time I balanced on the edge, but we're talking <laughs> out of- One and a what? Da thousand putts? Yeah, countless, right. Gotta be countless putts <laughs> yeah. at this point. Um, so yeah, I don't know what we're really catering to. So once again, I think that's why they just look at it as like all this effort and attention is being drawn at this by uh, the handful of people that it somehow affected, right. yeah. you know, someone's really butthurt, hands down, that they didn't get that stroke, or they had that extra stroke added to the card yeah. that they didn't hold out. Right. So you just give it to the player. Sure. The tie goes to the runner. Yeah, it's, it's not something that's going to affect too many people's scores over yeah. any course of time, small amount of instances. So they just got to draw the line somewhere. You know, that's what I'm saying, what the PDGA is thinking. And I think they should make the top part of it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but that. But I also think that they should make the top. Just hear me out. They all ha should have to carry the same uh, specs. Uniform. Uniform. Yes, that's what I was going to oh, say. Yeah. Another point, probably why it's not, is because there's so many different types. Right. And anybody could come up with a basket that's shaped like a bowl, right? And the, oh, On the the, top, yeah. right. They so you're even, right. They'd they, have to be the same. Even, I remember um, years back, me and my buddy were super into Gateway, um, and we wanted to get these Titan baskets from Gateway. I think they were at the time. And I'm not sure what series of baskets they do anymore. Um, they they wanted to know what kind of events you'd run, and they wanted to give you good baskets to a place that was going to make a good course because mm -hmm. it would have their name on it. I thought that was a really respectful way to look at your own, your own business and your product. Sure. But the PDJ will not let you run a, like a, a sanctioned certain tier of event if you don't have a specific basket either. Gotcha. Like you can't have like you can have I think homemade baskets and run like an X C tier or, mm. or maybe even a C tier. I'm not sure about that. Um, but you can't have that and run a B tier or an A tier. Then if you wanted to run an A tier, there might be some baskets that you you can't use from a B tier side of things. Right. So. They do oh, have to fit specs. They do yeah. have to yeah. fit specs. They should be more uniform. It would only make sense. We complain about, you know, this this person has their favorite basket, like somebody would have their favorite hockey stick or, yeah. or baseball bat. Right. So uniform that stuff up a little bit. Don't yeah. make it a monopoly. I'm not saying one right. company, but companies just like the height and the width specs, the chain number specs, they should be doing that with the top assembly. Well, speaking of the tiers, there was another new rule that PGA came out with, that now you have to be a PDGA member to play in B tiers. Previously, it was A tiers and above. Do you think this is a good thing or bad thing, or do you have any thoughts on why they may want to do this? Uh, I think it's good. Absolutely, hands down. Legitimizes the sport. Yeah, and I think it's great that C tiers, there's an option there. It's a great way to get your feet wet into competitive play. A sanctioned event okay what does that mean they can experience it and then say okay i'm ready to compete on a slightly higher level in a b tier and you know be a part of the organization and really know the rules and i think that's important yeah. because when you're a member you're expected to know those rules of play and hopefully right it will legitimize it more right exactly i like that the pdj has it so you can sign up for any tournament but having to go that extra step, get certified, and understand rules is something that when people look at the sport, it legitimizes it. People right. look like they're acting in a certain manner because some of our rules are on conduct. So right. exactly. it's good It's good for that uh, for the sport to, to push that. Yep, I agree. We're all in agreement. That's a, a good rule. Easy. Go. Now, maybe Next. one of our favorite new rules, uh, players can now ask to take a bathroom break and not be penalized <laughs> four times. <laughs> I can't believe we yes. started with the bathroom, and here we it are again. It all comes full circle. <gasps> no, I think that's... Inception much? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, did you change the rule? Was that you? No. 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 I think it's amazing. I mean, I, 
I have heard of cards of women who have known of a card mate who needed to use the bathroom and on the next tee they would take as much time as they were allowed before you know getting a penalty right. of their own each person hoping that the person would get back in time and I just I, I think that's crazy I you yeah. know to say I, I need a couple minutes or I need a something it's it's not like you're really slowing down yeah. play it's I don't know how it wasn't a thing before. To be honest yeah. with you, how could that be? Like, you would be so uncomfortable. I'm a realist. <laughs> like, I, I have to figure it out from that. And we talked about having bathroom on site. And you use the bathroom when you need to go. And if you're playing disc golf, you go before rounds. If you're out on the course and you have to use the bathroom, you better believe it's an emergency. <laughs> what are we talking about here? Yeah, right. You're I don't think, oh, let's, uh, let's wait till hole three. Yeah. <laughs> Let's wait till whole seven. Perfect yeah, timing. So like, Perfect timing. Yeah. If you have three minutes to look for your, we'll just throw out like some like made up plastic name. We'll call it like DX plastic. That's not a made, made up, up plastic name. <laughs> you know, we're just looking for some like we're looking for your lucky roller disc yeah. under some leaves for three minutes. Is my point. And someone can't go to the bathroom. Yeah. Did for it, probably less time. For probably less time. <laughs> I'm so happy they changed that. Yeah. And I really hope that this brings more bathroom access throughout the course. Because, I, man, if you're on the farthest hole from the bathroom, that's also, like, right. well, <laughs> stressful. <laughs> so we run the event at our local course. Yeah. And we we bring in the porter potty We lock it up the day before. Mm -hmm. We unlock it for the tournament. We lock it up at the end of the day. That's, like, our agreement. The park's never pushed us and said you got to do something with this. It's not our responsibility because that's how we took care of it. I keep thinking about putting a porter potty down. Uh, the water department has a road that goes through the mid belly of the course Yeah. over by hole nine and 10. Maybe we should put a porter potty there. That'd be great. And, and if you could do it, I think you should mm -hmm. because that it's non issue. It's just yeah. a non issue. Only going to help. Once again, we're back to amenities <clears throat> at the design of the course. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And circuit. I do too. I also think that if we really do want to grow the sport and welcome women into this community even more, I, it's really important that there is access yeah. to a space like that for them, Absolutely. for me, because I know how I felt and I don't want another woman to feel like she's stuck or that nobody should have to. Uh, yeah. I, I just, it's just, yeah. Mm -mm. You know, like. So this is awesome. That's yeah. all to say this yeah. is amazing. Potty talk. And it's the. <laughs> who That's knew? The new name of you got who potty knew? Mouth. Episode Podcast. one, Potty. <laughs> Pottycast. Pottycast. <laughs> no, but it, it's great. And I hope it's. Uh, Just go down the hole. It starts like a whole, a whole new chat on this. Yeah. For I, tournament directors. And I like it. I like it. I like the leeway. I think we're looking at yeah. it from a perspective that why are we doing this to people out there? They're out there for what could be their second four-hour round. Yeah. That's eight hours on a, on a property. Yeah. That's a long time. That's a long time. A long time. Can we talk this about one off. more rule? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, yes. uh, because I saw this graphic about um, the lie for the Mando and going towards the basket and not toward the Mando. Yes. yes. I think that is a really fascinating change because of the way some... Sorry to cut you off. No. Um, because also because of some holes, how they lay out. Like, on the tee, sometimes you don't even know where the basket is, but you can see the mando. If it's like a right. big dog, like a big turn, a something, how do you know? And, and how can you properly set up your shot, monitor your other card mates? I mean, you know, we all officiate each other, right? right. So how do we, how can you feel comfortable or... I, I don't know, okay to call a football if there's a football? Yeah. What is that? I think that's so, crazy. So I think in your explanation, I'm with you. I'm with you. In some point, port, uh, some points of the course, whether you're being on the tee or still trying to find your way to the fairway uh, turn, yeah. you, you just might not know where the basket is. I think you got to do your best. I think well, this of course. Rule, I think this rule applies when you're, you're trying to cheat the rule where you know that the basket's not that way, but yet you can't help but to step this way to pretend that it is, to give you a better footing, maybe out, better lie. Just, we all know this is a game of inches. Right. Yeah, so right, sure. when, <clears throat> if, would you be able to 
call that if someone's just like look like they were a little left or a little right and you don't have eyes on the basket? I don't think so. I don't. I think anybody could plead their case and be like, I think I'm that way. I think they're creating more gray area. I think you need to play the intended lie forward. Um, so you think fairway wise, I not like don't even think about basket or mandos in general. I, I think yeah, you have to take into account the mandatories because, for example, well, you gotta go around them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you should probably think about yeah, them if you're gonna throw your right. Shot. Because if I if I have to play to pass a mando and yeah. there's a large obstacle in my way where I cannot take a run up and throw my disc, but then I claim that well, okay, the mandatory is this way but the basket's this way. So I'm gonna run away from this obstacle and go this way. It, it's just too much, it's too much. You should play the forward intended lie of the course. If the course is telling you especially to go around a mando, you should definitely be playing towards that mando. Your lie should be behind your disc towards that mando. So you're not in agreement with the rule change? I guess I'm not. <laughs> okay, oh, look into the camera, my, say it. Yeah. <laughs> I just realized that As I just you were saying. totally changed my own opinion. Yeah. I think you did it on the spot. No, I that did. was cool. We saw those wheels wow. turn. That was terrible, but okay. I just, terrible rule I, think it's, yeah, I just think it's fascinating, really, especially, I think, I think it was the PDGA put out a graphic of the, of two, like, okay, here was the old rule, here was the new rule, side by side, and I just, I looked at that and I saw, I thought, okay, not only will I have to rethink, you know, courses I've played that I know there yeah. are mandos or certain things, like what is my new, you know, footing in this landing zone or whatever. I mean, but to also, you know, look at other players and, and ask the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's it odd, gets a little, little cloudy somewhere yeah. sometimes, but I think the PGA is just trying to make it, whether you're for or against it, I think they're just trying to make it more clear, whatever it is. Like that we're always going towards the basket. Yes. Regardless of obstacles. Your footing should always go. Because like, what if, for example. Like that's clear, saying it like that. But yeah. what, what if, do you think of fairways? What if it's somebody was going with, um, I don't know. I see I'm like, I'm back to that way. <laughs> yeah, it's so terrible. Yeah. I'm conflicted. I'm neutral. All right. I will play it by the rule that they set up. I just wish they would lock it in to know it because it's going to go back and forth. It's going to drive right. me mad. I think that, like you said, it might be one of those where they're trying to make it more clear, but they may not be making it more correct. You could, yeah. Like my first, okay. Cause my, my, yeah. Yeah, my first reaction was like, yeah, great rule change, the way, the way I perceived it. And I wanted to explain why the two differences, it helps. And I just found myself explaining why it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, so, but... I could think of little nuances and stuff like that where I could see it's going to help, but then again, I could see why it could be confusing too. Yeah. Or how it could become more gray area. So. How about this? We'll loop back to this topic after we all play a tournament. Oh, yeah. After we start our seasons and you gotta call see the how we hours. feel. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta call the football. Have you called anybody on a football yet out no, in a tournament? No, I have you? not. I haven't. I'm sure you have. No, there was it's a misplay, terrible. but not not a football. I think it may be the divisions that we play. You're an MPO. I'm like MA3. Like, yeah. there's just a, a different reason why people play these different divisions. Right. This is actually interesting. So I can't say I've ever called anybody, but we have, we as, we as a card, I guess, have warned a person or maybe taught them a rule. It was a C tier. So this is interesting. You know, you have to be a PDG member for a B tier. Yeah. But like taught them this rule of, hey, this is how much space you get behind your lie, or mark your disc, or don't, or okay, if you do, you can't step on the disc, or wow. this. And it's it's interesting being in that position where you say, okay, I'm in a rated competitive round, but yet I'm, I'm teaching right. <laughs> when I shouldn't be, but I don't want to call them on something if they don't know. What do you think the PDGA is afraid of by not pushing all PDGA players to take qualifications? in their registration at all. I think it adds to the the, the larger uh, pool. Well, I was going to say the, the it would be harder to either get into the sport or stay in the sport. And the size of the sport is, I think the PGA is trying to do whatever they can to get and keep more players in the sport. 
And I think, oh, you have to take a test to play disc golf would be yeah. kind of the connotation people would get from that. Whether that's actually true of people who are in the sport may like that, that, oh, now everybody who's playing tournaments knows the rules. And that would be great. But from an outside perspective, I don't think it would be as perceived as well. Okay. Yeah, no. I, I, think, I think that would backfire greatly. And I think it would really exclude folks and turn them off to the idea of competitive play for fun. I mean, not everyone wants to compete on the pro level. And some want to casually play, but be in tournaments and enjoy that feel of going to an event and things. And I can just see, especially as a first time tournament player, how that would add to the stress or the desire to want to start playing competitively. Right. Right. So I think that's, that's tough, but I think it's important, especially on pro levels, you know, pro tour majors that you have to take that test and you have to know yeah, of course. Like at that level, yeah, you all need to obviously <laughs> be right. at that point. completely knowledgeable. But I, for first-time players or people who want to play rec divisions, I really don't think that's I, a good move. I, I don't agree um, with that either. If I'm understanding what you, th I think you took what I thought I said. <laughs> I'm gonna start over. Hopefully, I said it right the first time. But I think if you're gonna uh -oh. sign up for the PDGA, <laughs> what did I do? I think what did I you, do? I think if you're gonna <laughs> sign up for the PDGA, yeah, if you're gonna sign up for the PDGA. I think the PDGA should just offer this free test of some general knowledge that you read it, you understand, nice page, and then it should be etiquette, rule, something. Well, they send you Lies. the book. Well, they, they, but, before, but before they take your money, before, ah. before they say you are a PDGA member, understand and answer this quick questionnaire to finalize your membership. And it would be people wanting to be professional, or I'm sorry, or amateur, or just PDGA members, that they would, it would only help the population of people out there with a little more knowledge, some general knowledge to start off. Because we have such an influx of people playing that don't know anything. Right. So at least if they're willing to sign up, well, give them the rules. If they are willing to just go out and try it and play, by all means, I think um, the PDJ should offer like, First time, no PDJ fee or something like that for your first tournament. They should waive your $10 fee if it's your first tournament. You should register. Get a free registration. Answer the free questionnaire. If it's something, offer something yeah. of knowledge to those who want to be part of uh, the, the association. Now, what about this? So the, the line is of tiers, what tier it is that you need. But what if it's division? Because I feel like a lot of the stuff we're talking about is, is goes back to why people are playing the sport. If you're playing an MA or FA3, and I don't know what division was when you were teaching somebody, but I've found the same thing. Someone may not know the rules. And I have no problem teaching, because I'm playing MA3, I'm just playing to have fun. I think maybe the line for what you're saying is where you need to know the rules and be tested on it. Maybe a certain division at any tier, right? Maybe once you get to MA1, FA1, MPO, FPO, that's when you need to have that certification instead of the line being a tier right. it's professional division having to take the exam is good for the b tier for sure it says yeah. you're you really want to push the skills that you have on a bigger stage that's what usually a b tier can mean mm -hmm. it's going to draw in hungry players for all the prizes and absolutely you should be well versed in your rules you should go through the rigorous it's not very rigorous. It's it's willing. It's it's very giving. It's mm -hmm. an open book test, but it's a lot of <laughs> yeah. questions. It's a lot of questions, and they're very complex. <clears throat> so the PDJ does a good job to make sure you understand what you're trying to, um, that you have the knowledge to go be out on a, a bigger stage. So that's good. But I think just something on a small scale. For example, like Joanna ran into a player that just didn't even know what marking her lie was. And you don't need to go on into a whole book to read about all of it to just maybe give a short synopsis. They did a great job putting out all these slides too. And they, they might entertain doing something like that, showing you and then asking you a question and hit the answer yes or no right there. Something simple. Yeah. It's worth doing. I, sure. I think if they're going to, you know, one day ask this of players to, you know, take a test, you know, to play certain events or to right. play in certain divisions, let's say, they have to be ready with educational materials. 
you know, I think just getting the book is not, <laughs> that's dense. And that can be scary to read and comprehend and say, oh my God, I have to know everything in here and right. be solid with it and put it into practice. Like, okay, take a breath. It's, it's okay because a lot of these things you know naturally by playing all the time, right? right. So I, I, this off season too, I saw some videos with, you know, Sarah Hokum doing some rule short clips. Did you see any of those? The ladies of disc golf do great videos. Like of putting out that's amazing. That, yeah, right? yeah. Like yeah. that's amazing. I think more of that and making rules seem less scary and more exciting yeah. um, is the avenue that they need to go to. Uh, yeah, just excite people about wanting to play by the rules and, yeah. and saying, "Oh my gosh, this is this is important. This right. sport is legitimate, and we are all here to play by the same rules and have a great time." but like aim for that professional life. Gotcha. I think once again, just the le legitimizing of it, Yeah. just making it a more professional thing. Even if you are playing as an amateur, right. it's a more professional mm -hmm. way of going about our sport. I like the idea of division too. Yeah. Like if you're going to say you're an advanced player, you like, should know like all the rules. Minimum, like you really like should know all the rules. Out. Maybe <laughs> also further down, Yeah. but at least I yeah. like that. That's important. Like if you're going to represent the sport in yourself and play on an advanced level, even if it's, you know, self-proclaimed because right. <laughs> you register for divisions on your own, like you should want to do that. Right. Oh, that's a good one. I, yeah. I like it. It's going to grow, like we keep saying, into other things and it's going to only help, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was a great rule. Thanks for bringing that one up. There okay. are tons of rules that they changed. <laughs> Other, other interesting ones, maybe we'll talk more about them in another episode. Um, but for this episode, we'll move on to our last topic, the sponsorship boom of disc golf. Lots of companies are throwing money into the sport. The two of you have uh, been benefited by this. Um, if you want to plug your own sponsorships real quick, we'll also talk about how um, all the money being thrown at the pros. So, Joanna, what was your new... Sure. This year, I'm sponsored by Infinite Discs. Congratulations. Yay, thank you. Very exciting. Very exciting. I'm Lou. I'm Lou. So, uh, that can't be it. That's everything? <laughs> what no, do you want you... me to say? What? Say what you say when the camera's not on. You're oh, my gosh. You're, the walls, <laughs> you're jumping out of your skin. You're excited. Okay. You're losing your mind. Lou's right. <laughs> um, I got the email, and I... Um, I was at the office that I work at and I yelped and I went outside <laughs> and <laughs> I called people. I, did I shed a tear? I don't know. Did I shed a tear? At the world point, will never did. know. Okay. It was many. Yeah. Um, it was just, it was really exciting. I mean, as I said in the intro, I just started playing in 2020 and to have a company like Infinite, I mean, it, what can you say? Like, take a risk on you as a player, as a person, as, as someone they see with passion and say, yes, like, we believe in you and we want to see you grow in this is, is, oh, stop. <laughs> no, it's just, it's a really cool feeling. And yeah. to, to know that I made my passion and desire to grow disc golf, like, very apparent in the materials that I sent to them is, it just, it feels like I'm doing something right and something authentic and that it's it's true and so yeah it's i hope it's the start of a very long partnership in this sport and who knows i think the possibilities are endless i think when you <laughs> start off like a bottle <laughs> like rocket start, yeah i mean you know lou i mean you said to me you're like hey let's uh reach for the reach that's for the it. stars that's the like, only place don't, you reach. don't ever limit anything and i i never thought this was possible and so the fact that it happened at this moment in time is <laughs> just cool okay it's yeah, just no, cool <laughs> yeah no it's 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 exciting so um, was that good Lou? Yeah, was that good <laughs> yes. congratulations thank you i'm not gonna get tired of saying that to you i think it's well deserved because <laughs> i think it's easy for someone to take an application and just see what you are about and say yeah let's work together and that's what happened to me with birdie this year and birdie is been on my radar since I heard about it. Since I met them, I was just like, I gotta do business with this person, surround myself around him, because he's, he's doing really cool things and I, I think I could learn something from him. And all our conversations have been 
really good and we're right in line with each other uh, in terms of like future plans and working together so I can't be any more happier like I've just put this on my mind for a couple of years now and um, this is my first sponsorship with uh, like a disc company so it's cool to to, to be with a company that in yeah. my mind I've projected for some success for all of us and uh, yeah I can't wait for this cold weather to go away. Yeah. I can't, I can't wait for <laughs> Let's get out to there. Start. Yeah, like, I think official practice for me starts uh, in a week and a half, where the exercise grind is Like it won't be done. cold still in a week and a yeah. half? Um, there's still going to be snow on the ground. <laughs> no, there's still going to be snow. Come on, Lou. No, but Just one less layer, maybe? One yeah. and a half. Yeah. <laughs> Take a sock off. Throw it out. Yeah. <laughs> <Just>, uh, <laughs> or an odd number socks. of socks. Yeah. But, oh. um... It's, it's cool. I'm excited to, to be sponsored. Um, I'm excited to just be involved in disc golf in yet another avenue. And I've, I felt like I've done so much. But once again, working with Haja Media all over again and working with Joanna, this friendship just popped up out of yeah. nowhere. It's, it's all awesome. And I'm, I'm looking forward to all, all of this for next year. So yeah. Well, congratulations so much to the both of you. And I think it's just a great uh, demonstration of what the sport is kind of evolving into. There used to be kind of a handshake, you know, sponsorships with the pros and maybe some lower level, you know, local pros, stuff like that. But now it seems like everybody's getting million dollar contracts and there's so many more people in the sport. Where is all the money coming from? Is it good for the sport, the pros, the, the local people? What do you guys think? It's a lot. Topic. Oh, boy. Yeah. Hot topic. <laughs> I think it's fascinating, and I've, I've heard a lot of talks on this, honestly, that go both ways, that say, okay, this is fantastic for the growth of the sport, or saying, okay, this is not really sustainable. Like, are they looking at pandemic numbers, or is what, what have they projected, and mm. can they really keep – this up with so many large contracts. I don't know. Yeah. I, it's... The answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. It's real simple. <laughs> Joanna, if you look at disc golf. Well, obviously, they're not going to make a stupid decision for their own company. No, no, yeah. absolutely not. If you look at disc golf a decade ago and you look at disc golf a decade before that and a decade before that, if you look at it in these increments, you'll see the growth the growth of the courses, the growth of the players, the growth of the memberships, the growth, growth of the prize purses, the growth of the contracts. Everything grows. The boom that just happened is something that's impactful for the permanent. People were right. looking for an outlet, and they found disc golf. How many people do you know try disc golf and just like, ah, and walk away? Not very many. <laughs> Not very many. It's a very sticky game. Yeah. <laughs> so, so where are these people going? When, uh, you have, when you have an influx of yeah. who knows on a, like a, like on a public level, not wanting to play tournaments, not wanting to uh, compete or do leagues, but are the weekend warriors or the lunchtime break three holes yeah. or there's a, a course at a high school and they just go there and putt while their kids were, you know, are on the swings. Who knows? But there's got to be millions of those people out there in the country. But we're talking about active members in the PDJ somewhere around the 100,000. I mean... There's a there's a lot yeah. out there. Oh, definitely. So, so you think it's not a bubble? It's a legit boom, not. and are, it's not going to burst, and the whole sport's going to come down. The, the course oh, is, I never no. thought <laughs> crashing there's, down. There's come enough. on, dramatics. I'm not putting words in your mouth, am I? <laughs> come crashing I'm to, I'm down. I'm trying to picture it all come crashing <laughs> down. What would it take? What would it take for disc golf to just come I crashing don't know. down? Something big. I guess you know when you say yes, it's going to keep growing, right? So what would you guess contract numbers are two years in five years okay uh, what i suggest and well, it'll be fun to look back at this mm -hmm. yeah i suggest look that right in the camera right. i Just suggest <laughs> that we're going to see another blip in in the near future i'm going to say in the next year with a major a blip. with a major investor and in a brand something that's not in disc golf yet something like Nike. Like a like a Bushnell, how they like kind of came into yep. the arena. Adidas came in the same way. Yep. Someone's gonna come in and recognize. The, the holy shot happened. Last Someone year. is. Let's go. Wait, no. Tell you, tell me. I oh my <laughs> gosh! I wish I thought of this before right now. But wasn't it? Isn't there some European player who is sponsored by Nike? And they just announced this. Is that new? 
I think. I have. Said today? Is that yesterday? I've been at work for the last news. week. Yeah, no. This I don't think this is. I really hope. I I'm feel not like wrong. I because I, I remember seeing this. It was a dream. And I, <laughs> was it you? <laughs> it's not me. But Under Armour, if you're <laughs> if, if you're listening or watching. Hashtag not sponsored. Um. So so the last of my maybe not, but I think last, that'll be the huge. last to my point is something like. Tostitos, Gatorade, like a, a, like even a, a food company. No. Yes, yes. Here we go. I need my own. Katie Teta. I'm glad you pronounced it. I wasn't going to be able to. Right? Isn't it Nike? I don't know. I clicked it. It didn't bring me to a thing. Do, 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 do. I knew it. I was like, man, I'm telling you. I think there's an FBO player well, in Europe. Nike, Nike yes. Every single picture. She has a Nike sponsorship. That's and awesome. Yeah. That is great. How exciting, right? And she's... Obviously, one of the top players. I'm Say curious. Your name again? How do you pronounce Katie Teta. Are you guessing, or do you know that? I've heard it on okay. coverage. So, I mean, I hope. It's close. I hope that's I think correct that's or close. To. Latitude 64, mm -hmm. sponsored by Nike. Yeah. All right. So it's already happening. It's happening, and I. Yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit. I mean, when Nike you bring America, in. America, come on, get on it. Right. So to my point, because <laughs> I didn't on. know, you're going to have major <laughs> brands and companies and things that are starting to come into the sport to try to be maybe a first to get a bigger piece of the pot. And I think that's only going to make it even grow again. Yeah. yeah. Um, it just being what it is, it has its own growth rate. Now you throw people into it that aren't going away. It's, a, it's an influx. The influx could be a big enough push. We always have talked about disc golf in the mainstream where you could just flip it on on TV. Well, society today, it's not about flipping on TV anymore. Sure. You, yeah. you stream things when you want. It comes to you live. It's, um, it's great technology we have. I think brands are going to have no choice but to want to get involved. And that's just in this year. Yeah. Um, and we'll see that over the next five years. And then after that, you're going to see the ultimate growth. So I think in the next 10 years, when you're seeing a player who's getting a contract for a one-year deal, $2.5 million, might be normal. It might be normal. There might the, the product that they could push out to how many players are out there is, is what's going to be the factor. Why would these <laughs> brands all of a sudden be able to sell all this merchandise? I think bigger stores, Walmarts, Targets, just more whole, wholesale you know, transactions yeah. from these companies, they're going to have to increase their warehouse to anticipate for what just happened and what is coming. And I think that's what they're pl planning for is big manufacturing for disc golf, big push for the growth into that mainstream. And I think that happens in 10 years. Well, that's great, great aspirations. I agree with you. I think that's definitely the next step for the sport. Hopefully it's sooner rather than later. So we can take advantage of it while we're all still fairly yeah. young. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that will wrap it up for this episode. Thank you guys so much for being on. Um, I think we're yeah, going to be a regular here. thing, the three of us. Um, try to make a weekly episode. Um, it's going to be posted on YouTube, the video. We're also going to be posted on all the different podcast places. So find us there. Leave us a review. That will be great. Um, a couple other things that are happening. We have an Instagram we made recently. So follow Heiser underscore media on Instagram. Um, if you'd like to become a Patreon, we also have a disc giveaway. This will be the disc that we'll be giving away this month. No, it's taped to the wall. Don't oh, grab it. <laughs> it's foolproof. Um, so if you'd like, if you're interested in that, um, check out our Patreon. Link for that will be in the description. Other than that, we'll catch you next hole.